It's pretty awesome. scary, actually, when you say the Undertaker calls me. <laughs> well, like... <laughs> as long as it doesn't mess with my lights, everything's cool. <laughs> or I'll talk to The Rock, and then he'll, he'll ask me something or, or have a few comments, or he just calls to check on me. That's the kind of guy he is. To hear that all you guys are like good buddies outside of the ring. Well, I, well, I just <laughs> wouldn't go as far to say good buddies. Uh, you know, uh, partners and uh, you know, and what we do is kind of a uh, you know an inside circle there, a kind of a close knit group. And sometimes there's a lot of animosity, and sometimes uh, you know, line, lines are drawn between friendship and business, and you go from there. But I mean, I think there's a concern, you know, among, among that level of top guys, and generally all the guys in as a company. But, and, and that's certain close circle. Yeah, you stay in contact with each other because it's going down the road and, and, uh, and having matches with these guys, you get to know them pretty damn well. Uh, I've been feeling pretty good. I'm about two months out of my surgery right now as we speak. And uh, it seems like uh, slowly some of my symptoms that I've been having are kind of starting to disappear a little bit better. A little more, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. And uh, I kind of have good days and bad days and now it seems like I'm having more good days. So I think uh, it took me out of a lot of danger getting the bone spurs off my spinal cord. Now some of the symptoms are starting to go away and I think that's, that's a good sign for me. This was very serious surgery. I mean, this wasn't just routine, was it? Well, you know, it was 10 years or better playing uh, football than 10 years of pro wrestling. It kind of caught up to me. I had a lot of arthritis degeneration, you know, some uh, changes in there with the bones. I had bone spurs growing against my spinal cord. Of course, there was no space at uh, three and four. So I had to go in there and drill those off my spinal cord to relieve the pressure. I had a lot of uh, pain in my, in my arms and uh, my legs, a little, little uh, hyper reflexive in, in the lower body. Uh, just some crazy things like that. And, you know, the nervous system is a whole different ball game. It seems like now that the, you know, the fusion is starting to heal up, those bones have got to grow together in my neck. You know, it seems like my life is kind of like a VCR. So I've had the pause button pushed. And so now it's time to push the play button and get on with things and maybe push the fast forward because it seems like I missed out on a lot. You know, I missed uh, my job with the World Wrestling Federation being on the road 200, better 200 days a year. That's what I've been used to for the last 10 years. So it's been kind of boring sitting in the house and uh, not being productive. So it's time to get on with it. Now, well, it's kind of hard because any, anytime you're at a high level of, of success and doing what you love to do, and it just gets taken from you. If you walk away from it, that's one thing, but you know, because of the situation I was in, you had to walk away and it is, it's hard. I, I really, since, since I left the ring, I haven't been able to, or not, I wouldn't say haven't been able to, I don't really like to, I haven't watched one single match in, in its entirety. I, I watch a segment here or there. I haven't watched a complete show, so I'm really out of touch with what's going on because it's hard to watch. And uh, I keep up with uh, all the guys. Uh, I'm on the sidelines and uh, you know, I was instrumental with uh, you know, The Rock and getting to the level that he's at. Then again, also The Rock has that talent and the World Wrestling Federation is the, the vehicle that, that pushes him. Uh, so a lot of people are responsible for him being where he's at and I certainly don't take any of the credit other than the fact that I was one of his opponents. Uh, Triple H has done the same thing, has ascended to the top level. He's a workhorse type uh, uh, heel in, in the business. I'm, I'm not a jealous person. I, I guess I just wasn't brought up that way. There, there's probably a lot of people in the business are jealous, but I always looked at it as this way. When it, when it all was said and done, you had a, a ring, a squared circle, as we always call it, just for a hell of it. You had this square that everybody gets a chance to go in there and run off the ropes, hit each other, fall down, cut interviews, be involved in storylines. You all have the same opportunity, and you make the most of it. Some guys make it to the top, some guys never will. You know, we all had the same opportunity. I'm on the sidelines, but no, I'm not a jealous person. I'm happy with the things I've done, and I'm happy with the things they're doing. Do you think, Steve, that you will return to the ring? I don't know. That, that's the big question, because right now I just had my first set of x-rays, you know, a couple weeks ago. Uh, bone fusion's in place. My titanium plate, my screws are still holding up. I hadn't blown anything out. Of course, when you're sitting around eating, eating enchiladas and drinking beer, there's, there's not a high risk factor there, other than the cholesterol level. Uh, you know, I, it, time will tell. I have a very conservative doctor. Have you thought about the notion that you might not be able to return to the ring? Yeah, I think about it all the time. You know, it's one of those things that, that uh, hell, I've been off for four or five months now, and I'm two months out of surgery. And uh, yeah, that's something I think about probably every day. But uh, I don't center my whole life about it. But I mean, when you're sitting at the house, there's not a whole lot of things you can do other than doing the little projects I've been doing in the house. And you think about making money, you think about being productive, you think about doing what you love to do. And the last 10 years of my life being dedicated to, to uh, the, the pro wrestling and the last four or five years with the World Wrestling Federation. So if, if there was that possibility that you might not be able to uh, go back into the ring, you, you will accept that? Yeah, yeah, you got to. I, I don't, like I've always uh, said, you know, in, in the World Wrestling Federation, I don't ever expect anybody to feel sorry for me. That's, that's not the kind of person I am. And uh, 
I won't feel sorry for myself. I'm not a crybaby. Not a crybaby? <laughs> no. I don't think people would accept Unless that. Unless <laughs> you put old Yeller on. That's a tearjerker. <laughs> that's the only thing that's going to bring Steve yeah. Austin to a tear. Well, why is that movie always so sad? <laughs> no, you got to look at it this way. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind to a degree. But, you know, it's just like, uh, say, okay, Stone Cold Steve Austin's no, no longer in the ring. Man, there's always going to be the, those Stone Cold Steve Austin fans that made me at one time, you know, the hottest guy in the world as far as, you know, the world of sports entertainment goes. But you got you can't live in the past. You're not going to sit there and go to a World Wrestling Federation match while The Rock and Triple H or The Undertaker is out there banging each other and just sit there with your arms crossed, mope, and say, man, I wish Stone Cold was here. You live in the present. If you're living in the past, it, it, no, no matter who you like in, in, in any sport, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident and I'm happy with the success I had. And I don't think that the Stone Cold Steve Austin story is going to stop just because I'm not in the ring right now. What is it that you miss most? Uh, an adrenaline rush, being in front of 20,000 people in a World Wrestling Federation event. You know, the pay-per-views, just uh, excitement. Living on the road, I mean, it, it's, you get used to it, it's in your blood. And, uh, you know, hell, going to your mailbox every two weeks and seeing what you got next was always a blast, too. It'd be like doing the old Toyota jump up thing when you get a check. That was always a lot of fun. <laughs> the biggest thing is the adrenaline rush and just blowing the roof off a building when your music hits and going out there. And uh, whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, if, if that other guy is getting booed out of the building, it's just uh, the tension in the ring, the, just everything that goes with it. Because you can, it's to, to me, you know, we're sports entertainment, but when I'm out there, it's the, it's the real deal. And you just miss that being being involved so much. And uh, anytime you don't feel feel that way, at least in, in the World Wrestling Federation, because I can speak for that, then you really don't know what you're doing. What do you want your fans to know? Is that Guys, you know, I'm, I'll be back. No, nah, yeah, I just, uh, hell, I've had a damn good time. And uh, if, if uh, the Stone Cold story gets put back in gear and goes forward, uh, great. If it doesn't, if it gets uh, sidetracked and steered into a different arena of acting or whatever, that's cool too because, like I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be out there doing something. And uh, if, if I'm attached to it, I'll, I'll put every bit of work ethic into it. I did, you know, with the World Wrestling Federation to create what myself and the World Wrestling Federation created with the Stone Cold thing. So success is what drives me, being good at whatever you choose to do. I mean, it doesn't you have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. And you can, you can be or do anything, basically, I think, anything you want. But you got to bust your ass to get to the top. Just imagine facing the world like this. A massive growth has left this three-year-old disfigured. A deformity so shocking, people cruelly called him the elephant boy. People would stop and stare, and quite a few kids that would start crying and run away from him. From the day Maddox Flynn was born, it was obvious to his mom, Nicole, that something was terribly wrong. I was terrified. I, I didn't know what it was. The small tumor began growing at an alarming rate. It blinded his left eye and distorted his mouth, making speech almost impossible. Doctors didn't know how to treat it. I was very determined. I was going to find a doctor because um, throughout the whole world, there has to be somebody. Help would come thousands of miles away. I can help this child. Looking at a photo, renowned New York vascular surgeon Dr. Milton Weiner diagnosed Maddox with a lymphatic malformation. By the time he's four or five, it could potentially be double the size. My immediate reaction upon seeing photos was that I can do something. This was certainly a condition that we see quite often, and uh, this is something that I can do. I can help this child. We know for certain that it's not a hemangioma. It's known as a lymphatic malformation. These never go away. As the child gets older, the lesion, the malformation gets bigger and bigger and becomes more and more disfiguring. It would get much bigger than this. It could get two, three times the size of this. And not only that, it's already caused impairment. It's already potentially caused blindness in that eye. He has other problems. He's unable to uh, articulate because his lip is pulled down. His movement of his upper lip is restricted. Uh, so apart from disfigurement, there is also physical disability. 
which will get worse. Maddox was flown from his hometown in Edmonton, Canada to New York City's Roosevelt St. Luke's Hospital. Mike Flynn carried his son to the operating room. Removing the massive growth is extremely complicated and took 12 hours of surgery. He had to reposition his nose and his lip and the corner of his mouth. The difficulty with removing it is making sure that one gets as much of it as possible and leaving as much normal tissue behind so that one can reconstruct. Maddox emerges from the OR and his parents race to his bedside. The sight of their little boy's face, tears and all, has them overcome with emotion. This is a dream come true. It's you know? I started crying and I just held him and I told him how much I was proud of him and that he looks beautiful. Just three months later and still healing, take a look at Maddox. But there are more surgeries to come. Today, he's undergoing a critical procedure to save his eye by removing scar tissue. Are you ready? We're going to fix your eye up? Good. Now watch this. Brave Maddox knows just what to do, bracing himself for the operation. His transformation is astounding. The little boy who once scared people away is now proudly showing his new face to the world. Are my eyes glazed? This woman may look and sound drunk, but she's not. She's actually suffering a massive stroke. And amazingly, it was this cell phone video that helped save her life. Was the right side of your face numb this morning? No. The video was shot by her fiance, Dave O'Neill. At 8 a.m., Diane McPeters awoke feeling tired and sluggish. Her droopy face and slurred speech told her fiance right away that something was wrong. But Diane refused to go to the hospital. And so I really, because I wasn't hurting her or anything, like I said, so I didn't really think about being a stroke. Never even crossed my mind. She was very slow to respond to what I was telling her. Uh, she would not, uh, she had a droopy face. Uh, she was talking in a very, very low, which, uh, low tone, which is something she doesn't do. Uh, very often, uh, unless there's something wrong. And so I was trying to get her to, uh, let's go to the hospital and get this taken care of. I was definitely worried. Then at 3 p.m., they went out to the porch. The stroke was rapidly worsening. I was sitting here, she was sitting there. Dave took out his iPhone and began recording. I would like for you to speak into the, into the camera here. To me, it looks like you're talking out of the left side of your mouth. Incredibly, Diane is smoking a cigarette, still refusing to go to the hospital. I could not believe what I was saying. I threatened you to call 911, is that correct? And why should I not do that? Because, just, just, just give it tonight. I was thinking what I wanted to say, but I couldn't say it. Dave had enough and called 911. I was definitely scared for her life. Diane was raced to the medical center of Plano outside Dallas. The prognosis was grim. She had a devastating brain attack. Diane was wheeled into surgery where Dr. Valib Janardin and his surgical team were waiting. You have a huge area that's not getting blood flow. When dealing with a stroke, time is crucial. In most cases, doctors could only guess when a stroke occurred, but Dave had the exact timeline on his cell phone. It was absolutely critical for me to know when the symptoms started. Dr. Janardin showed Diane how he snaked a micro-thin catheter through her body up to her brain to remove the clot and put her on the road to what he expects will be a full recovery. Diane has two special people to thank for her survival, her doctor and her fiancé. I owe him my life. <laughs>